So in this section of the chapter, we're going to be looking at potential energy curves. Those have a lot of useful information in them when we graph potential energy as a function of position. So in order to understand these graphs, uh, let's start here by looking at two things that we've seen already. One of them is the conservation of energy that says the amount of change in kinetic energy plus the amount of change in potential energy equals zero. In other words, if uh, kinetic energy goes up, potential energy goes down by the same amount and vice versa. This is known as the conservation of energy. And let's also look at the work kinetic energy theorem that says the net work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. So if we combine those two, if I'm going to replace this delta K with its equivalent work, and so work plus change in potential energy adds to zero, and then I'll move that delta U to the other side, and now I come up with work is equal to the opposite of the change in potential energy. And let's combine that again with something we learned in Chapter 7, our equation for work done by a general force, and that is the work is equal to the sum of all the force times uh, displacement intervals between some initial and final position. So if I re replace W then with its equivalent and take the derivative of this equation now, uh, take the derivative of both sides with respect to X, I see that the force acting on an object is opposite to the instantaneous change uh, with respect to X. In other words, the force is the opposite of the slope. Let's see how we apply this formula. So let's begin by applying our formula to our equation for potential energy of a spring. So here I have the potential energy of the spring as a function of x, its displacement. So I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to x and take the negative of it. So when I take the derivative of this with respect to x, k is a constant. I take the power on x, multiply it times the coefficient to come up with 1, and subtract 1 from the power of x to give me kx. And then this negative sign shows up right here. So I have the force is equal to minus kx. And, of course, we recognize this as the force of a spring, also known as Hooke's Law. Let's try it again using uh, gravitational potential energy. If I let x represent my vertical displacement or my height, then my gravitational potential energy, uh, we know the equation is mgx. So the derivative of this with respect to x is just mg, and then my negative sign shows up here. And we recognize that, of course, as the force of gravity is our weight, mg, in the negative direction, downward. Here's a sample uh, graph of potential energy on the y-axis, u, in joules, as a function of position x. So here's the curve of my potential energy, and I've divided it up into two regions. On the left side of the dotted line, you'll notice everywhere in that region, the potential energy curve has a negative slope. And everywhere to the right of the dotted line, the curve has a positive slope. And right on the dotted line, the slope of the curve is zero. Using our statement that talks about conservation of energy, delta U plus delta K equals zero, that tells me as I'm going down the curve and my potential energy is decreasing, that means my kinetic energy is increasing. And as I go beyond the dotted line, I see my potential energy is increasing, which tells me that my kinetic energy is decreasing. I can deduce that from my conservation of energy statement here. Also, what we can figure out is that if I start at x equals 0 and move in the positive direction, the force acting on my object during that time, according to this equation here, it's the direction of it is negative of the slope sign. So here I have a negative slope, so that means my force is negative of a negative or in the positive direction. 
And over here, the slope is positive, so the force acting on my object is negative of a positive or in the negative direction. So here I have a force in the positive direction. Over here, I have a force in the negative direction. So on the left side of the dotted line, if I'm moving to the right and my force is to the right, that's positive work when the force and the displacement are in the same direction. And we know that when we have positive work, we have a positive change in kinetic energy from the work kinetic energy theorem. And according to this over here, if my kinetic energy is going up, my potential energy is going down. And that agrees with what I see in my graph. On the right side of the dotted line, as the particle moves to the right, the force acting on it is to the left. So that's negative work being done when the force and displacement are in opposite directions to one another. And we know from the work kinetic energy theorem that negative work produces a negative change in the kinetic energy, which means I have an increase in my potential energy, which is exactly what I see here uh, to the right of the dotted line. The potential energy is increasing. Here's a sample potential energy graph that shows with the red line, the red curve, the potential energy of an object at all positions x. However, there's an additional constraint here in this graph. In this graph, we are shown that the total mechanical energy of our object is limited. It maxes out at 5 joules. So we can't have more than 5 joules of energy. That's the total amount of energy in the system. And we know that the total amount of mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential. So K plus U for this graph equals 5. And that is shown by this horizontal line here. I can rearrange this equation to show that the kinetic energy is 5 joules minus the potential energy. So if I pick any point on this graph, uh, let's say, for example, at x2, because my potential energy is 0, that means my kinetic energy must be 5. And at position x3, I see my potential energy is 3 joules, so my kinetic energy must be 2 joules. In other words, from the x-axis up to the red line is my potential energy, and from the red line up to the horizontal line is my kinetic energy, and the sum of the two will always be equal to 5 joules. Kinetic energy can never be negative. Our equation for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, so no matter what v is, plus or minus, it squares to be positive. So K is always positive. So what that means is, because this number is always positive, U can never be bigger than 5 joules. Okay, so over here, uh, we see that we cannot, the particle cannot be located to the left of position X1, because that would indicate that it has a potential energy greater than 5, and that is more than the mechanical energy of the system. So what that means is the particle is constrained to stay to the right of x1. Let's start here at this position just for example, x2. At x2, I have zero potential energy, but I have five joules of kinetic energy, which means it's moving. Let's assume it's moving to the left. If it's moving to the left, as it moves from x2 to x1, I see that the force acts to the right. Remember, it's the negative of the slope. The slope is negative. The negative of a negative is a positive. So the force acting on the particle as it moves from x2 to x1 is to the right. Its displacement is to the left. So that means negative work is being done on the particle. And we know that means it slows down. And as it slows down, its kinetic energy decreases. Remember, that's the the distance from the red line to the horizontal line, while the potential energy is increasing. When it gets to this spot right here at x1, that's when it runs out of kinetic energy. In other words, it stops moving. All the energy has converted to potential energy at this point, so there are 5 joules of potential energy now and 0 joules of kinetic energy. But the force acting on the particle is still to the right. So as it moves from x2 to x1, it slows down, it stops, 
at X1, and then it begins to move back towards X2, which means its potential energy is decreasing as it speeds up again. That's why this is called the turning point. The particle, as it moves from X2 to X1, it will stop at X1 and turn around and start going the other way towards X2. Now as it reaches X2, it reaches maximum velocity again because it has five joules of kinetic energy. And now as it moves towards X3, it's going to slow down until at X3, it will have three joules of potential energy and only two joules of kinetic energy. But then after it passes X3, it begins to speed up again, having less potential energy. As it passes X4, it begins to slow down once more as its potential energy increases. And then once it reaches X5, it maintains a kinetic energy of one joule and moves at a constant speed associated with a kinetic energy of one joule uh, at all locations past point X5. Remember, energy is conserved, which means the mechanical energy stays constant and the sum of the potential and the kinetic together is the mechanical energy. And of course, as a reminder, there are, these are only conservative forces at work here. Perhaps it's the gravitational force, perhaps it's a spring force, whatever. It is not, there is not any friction present, which means some of the energy would be transformed to heat. When there's conservative forces only, the energy only changes back and forth between potential and kinetic energy. Lastly, let's talk about some very specific points on the graph that have special qualities about them such that we give them a name. So for the first one, let's look at a system that has a total mechanical energy, energy of four joules. So we see that beyond the point X5, the total mechanical energy of four joules does not change, which means if I had an object here, it would have uh, four joules of potential energy. And if it was over here, it would also have four joules of potential energy. And even if it were to move uh, left or right, because we move it, the amount of potential energy would not change. And a marble sitting on a tabletop, a horizontal tabletop, would be an example of an object that is in neutral equilibrium. Remember the word equilibrium means the sum of the forces is zero. So at this point, the, there is the derivative of the graph, the slope, is zero. So the force acting on the particle is zero. That's why we call it equilibrium. And neutral because uh, to the left and to the right, there is no change in that situation. There's still no force acting on the, the object. Another special situation is one called unstable equilibrium. Let's look at the pink line where our system has a maximum amount of mechanical energy of three joules. Let's place the object right here at position X3. At that spot, all of my energy is potential energy because I have three joules of mechanical energy and three joules of potential energy. So that means zero joules of kinetic energy. So this object is not moving. It has no kinetic energy. But if it moved just the slightest amount to the left, it would experience a force to the left. And if it moved just the slightest amount to the right, it would experience a force to the right. So to be positioned at this spot X3, it is precarious indeed. And uh, we call this situation unstable equilibrium because the slightest movement to the left or to the right would cause it to leave that position. An example of uh, unstable equilibrium would be a marble balanced on top of a bowling ball. Just the slightest movement to the left or to the right would cause it to roll off. And our last uh, example is stable equilibrium. Let's constrain our setup now to a mechanical energy of one joule. We see if our particle was here, just like up here, all of the energy would be in the form of potential energy. And it cannot move to the left or to the right. It would be trapped because to do that means 
uh, the potential energy would have to go above one joule. And we that's not possible by our constraint here. And also by the constraint that kinetic energy cannot be negative. So uh, we can't move to the left or to the right. The object is trapped there. That would be an example of stable equilibrium. An example of stable equilibrium would be a marble inside a, a bowl. Or if we had the object over here, if it's at x2 with one joule of kinetic with one joule of mechanical energy at x2 there is zero potential energy so we know it has one joule of kinetic energy which means it would be moving and if it moved to the left the force on it would be to the right there would be its turning point and it would come back this way and once it passes x2 to be on the right of x2 the force is to the left and the turning point would be right there and so this uh, object would be trapped in this region right here. And it cannot leave this region. And it's always pushed back towards this center point at X2. We call that a potential well. It always is pushed back towards the bottom of the bowl. And it would roll back and forth inside the bowl with its energy swish-swashing between potential energy and kinetic energy.